Wild orcas swim up to 100 miles a day. Orcas have very strong family bonds and social ties. In 1970, off the coast of Washington state, a large number of orcas were captured. The young orcas were brutally taken from their families. The only surviving orca from those captured has lived in a tiny tank at Miami Sea Aquarium, swimming in circles for almost 52 years. Please, set Toki free. Let her feel the native cool water. Let her swim through the kelp beds. But most importantly, let her be with her family once more. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining our Toki TV, our weekly gathering in faith, prayer, and education for Skali Chuktanat each and every week. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, don't forget to type that in the chat. We love to see it. Uh, thank you to those of you who are watching overseas um, faithfully every single Sunday. Um, love seeing that you're here with us. So say hello in the chat. Um, we're going to go ahead and open up today uh, with Samuel Tommy. Thank you very much, Samuel, for being with us. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Samuel to open us up in a good way in prayer. Jackie <laughs> O Creator, thank you for bringing us to this day. Thank you for your blessings, your guidance, and your protections. Thank you for taking the harm, taking all that is adversary away from our path. We thank you for your continuing love and continually keeping us in your hands. And Creator, we ask 
for your forgiveness for who, who we are, for what we do, and for our weakness. And we thank you for your mercy, O oh, Creator. As you bless all the li that's living, as you bless all that is alive, as you bless all that is essential to life, we appreciate it and we love you and we are grateful that you keep in your divine order. And O oh, Creator, we are very fortunate that we can come together in this manner and that we can come and meet with our brothers and sisters around the world. It is a very fortunate time that we can do this and send our prayers, send our love, send our strength to Tokite. And as we send our love and our strength to Tokite, we send our love our prayers, and we also receive her strength. We send her ours, but we send her tremendous strength and hope. The strength that she carries within, the strength that she carries from centuries, the knowledge and the wisdom. And we are thankful for their relatives, the Lomi nation. We are so thankful that we are a family of global supporters and of global people who love and really care for Tokite and all the living that you have created. And I'm so thankful, Creator, that you have brought me to this day. You have seen me through a lot. And I'm very happy, very lucky that I can be within the power of this day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's good to see you uh, there uh, in Florida, Seminole Tribe there in Florida. Thank you, Samuel, very much for being with us. Uh, I don't know that you know how important that prayer is uh, or is today, um, Samuel. We we um, there was some news or some information put out, I should say, on Facebook that we were hoping to receive some updates and some news um, regarding Toki, and uh, we have not seen that uh, update as of yet. Uh, but we're still um, hoping that that is coming out soon, and continue to pray for that. Uh, my energy has been all over the place um, hearing about possibly hearing news. <laughs> and so uh, just encourage folks to use that energy uh, to ground that in the way that you just did um, play this video over. I've, I've, I've done that a few times to where just listening to your prayers has helped ground me um, and, and keep us focused on what we're doing here for, for Topete. So thank you very much, Samuel. I appreciate it. Alejandro, how are you? Um, how's it going there in Florida? Uh, you're on. You're on mute. I'm sorry. Yesterday, <clears throat> Saturday, I was at the Miami Aquarium. I was praying for Lolita Tokita Escalet Chetena. Uh, it was a special day because I share this this flower made of cedar tree. I have received this amazing gift. I keep in my heart, you know, from Lamy people when they came uh, to Florida two years about two years ago, I think. Um, we have an amazing ceremony in front of the stadium. Um, Lolita was baptized with her new name, Scarlet Chactana. So I brought this up to everyone yesterday, and everybody was saying thank you, thank you. So, like I said, every 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 time, please <clears throat> pray for Lolita. Uh, uh, I, I keep hopefully, you know, like uh, we will achieve this goal, and I have a lot of hope. She is very very healthy and ready for this trip. Hashka. Awesome. Thank you. Howard, how are you? How's it going? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I do have to report that there are, I think, two families of uh, orcas 
traveling by right now out my window, uh, but they're about five to six or seven miles away, so I can't really get a good look or any good photos of them, uh, but they're in the neighborhood, and it's just real good to know that we're populated by orcas all around. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Annette, and thank you, Samuel, for that beautiful opening flute music and prayer. It really does set a, a peaceful tone to start the program. Uh, I don't really have any news to report. Uh, we're waiting for something uh, to maybe be announced out of Miami, uh, maybe about the medical exam, but we don't know. So we're just waiting like everyone else to hear what the news is. I do invite everyone to uh, join me Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific uh, I'll be on live with the American Cetacean Society San Francisco chapter uh, to go deep on who Toki is uh, as an orca, the, the abilities of the species or sinus orca, all we know about them, and as a southern resident and a little bit into the character and the, the traditions and the culture of the southern residents, and then her strengths, her incredible abilities and her resilience and stamina and, and, and grace and how she carries what she learned as a Southern resident still to this day that keeps her on an even keel and uh, able to manage and cope and, and uh, stay healthy, physically and mentally healthy through all these years. So um, I'll be talking about that. Um, and that's really all I've got from here. That's my news. Thank you. And we'll put the link there. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can we can add the link uh, here, Howard, so people know where to find uh, where to find you uh, for Tuesday. Great. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. You guys will notice an, a new a new face on, on our Toki TV Sunday. Uh, we have a special guest with us today, Michael Weiss. Uh, Michael is a biologist at the Center for Whale Research and a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Exeter Center for Animal Behavior. He completed his bachelor's degree in biology at Reed College, where his th thesis focused on southern resident killer whale social relationships and completed his Ph.D. at the University of Exeter, developing methods and applications for cetacean social network analysis. His research focuses on how evolutionary and ecological factors shape social structure, how social relationships then feedback on individual fitness, and how social behavior can be incorporated into animal conservation efforts. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Michael Weiss. Hi, yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, so uh, again, really, really grateful to, uh, to, to be here today. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you, Howie, for kind of making the connection. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of what, what I've brought with me today is um, some video and some information, um, uh, really about southern resident killer whale um, social behavior, and really focusing on what I think is one of the most remarkable social behaviors that they engage in, which is this really regular food sharing. Um, killer whales, resident killer whales, uh, or salmon specialists, they eat chinook salmon, which is a fairly small fish compared to a killer whale. Uh, it's a big fish for us, small, relatively small prey for a killer whale. And yet uh, females, from everything we know, share up to over 90% of the fish that they catch. Um, so I thought maybe I could just uh, show some video and, and walk through it. I have a few minutes of a few different examples of prey sharing and, and talk through who's sharing and, and what we're seeing around this. And then Maybe open it up for just kind of some some discussion if that sounds if that sounds good to you all. Um, uh, yeah, if you wanted to queue up the video, I can I can go through it. I think I have uh, five different examples of prey sharing uh, that I think illustrate some, some interesting things about their social the southern resident social behavior. So this first video is, is from 2018. Um, that whale you see there, that's J46. Um, she's a, a young at this point kind of reproductively aged female. Um, and she is chasing a fish that you can just barely see by her nose there. Um, this was all collected from, uh, this was collected from a drone launched from shore uh, uh, under, under research permit. Um, 
The other whale who just came up, that is uh, J53. So what's interesting here is these two whales are related, but they're not mom and offspring. Um, and actually, strangely, the older whale here is actually the niece of the younger whale uh, with how the, the uh, generations work out. But basically, socially, she's more kind of an aunt's role to J53. Um, they're still chasing the fish here. And something I, that, that we find really interesting, it's a little bit of a poop, a little gross, um, is, is that um, there seems to potentially be some teaching that happens in this situation. So a lot of um, hunts, a lot of, of prey chases happen at depth. It's interesting that this one happened for so long uh, at the surface and involved this young whale, J53. It almost seems like potentially there's some teaching and learning happening here. Um, or, or maybe they're genuinely, genuinely having trouble. But on these next couple lunges is where J46 finally catches the fish. And then she catches it there. And then what you'll see is she'll jerk her head to the side and she'll actually break break the fish in half there now and half of that fish will, will float backwards and j53 will actually pick up the other half blow some bubbles and follow along with her um so this is prey sharing within a mantra line but actually not you know in the way we kind of see prey sharing happening a lot of times in the northern residents and also in the southerns where you have a, a mother sharing with a calf you're actually here getting an aunt sharing with a, a, a more distantly related mantra line member um, it does seem to be typically, you know, older whales sharing with younger whales. You don't see a lot of younger whales sharing with older whales, but there'll be some exceptions to that. Um, so this was our first observation of prey sharing from the drone. Uh, later, this was, this video is actually from, uh, from just last year. And here you have an example of a, a grandmother, that's J19, who just shared a fish, sharing with her daughter and grandkids. Um, so this is the J19 matra line. That's J19, J41, J51, and J58. J58 was it's just a little baby here. Um, and grandmothers we know are really important in killer whale society. Um, when a grandmother dies, uh, their offspring of both sexes, their grand offspring, have a higher mortality chance in the, in the years following the death of that grandmother. And one of the things we think they're uh, doing is sharing food. Uh, the grandmothers have experience in how to catch and process food. And as we see here, when they do catch food, they almost always share uh, with, with their offspring and grand offspring. Um, the other thing that they have is knowledge and experience of not just how to catch food, but where to find it which is probably one of the things that, that really benefits their, uh, the, their kids. Um, but we don't just see it really uh, directly from, from grandmothers to, to uh, their, their kin. We actually see some broader uh, non-kin, well, non-direct kin food sharing as well uh, that happens in some of these groups. And I believe the next video that should come up any second now. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, again, we have uh, J58 and J51, so the two uh, J19 kids chasing a fish around. But that whale behind them isn't their mom and it's not their grandma. That's J22, who is another J-pod whale, but is not even in the same matcher line. Um, not, not closely related at all. So these two little goofballs are kind of having a, a bit of a trouble catching this fish. And J22, who's one of the older females uh, in J-Pod at the moment, um, kind of just gets in there and, and gives them a hand. So there's J58 really uh, messing with, with J51 a bit as, as he tries to catch it. The fish runs away, and ultimately it's actually J22 who makes the kill. So what I find fascinating about this video in particular is not just that J22 shares with these two kids, but she seems to make this kill essentially on her own. She makes, she, she catches this fish almost entirely on her own. If anything, to me, it looks like the two younger whales are making it more difficult. Um, and she still shares with these two whales um, who are not, not close relatives. So there she goes, she catches it. Um, so, so one of the main differences, most of what we know about prey sharing in resident killer whales right now is based on the northern residents, which is the population that lives to the north of the southerns. And in that population, prey sharing is almost always within matriline. It's almost always, you know, 
Most of it is mothers feeding their offspring. But we all we know Southern residents have a different social structure, right? They have these more consistent pods that are made up of multiple natural lines with these really distinct local dialects. And what we're what we're starting to see in, in looking at prey sharing in the Southern residents, what we haven't, you know, collected quite enough data to do the formal analysis yet. But what it seems to me is that that's reflected in more generalized sharing behavior. There's also cases like this video where you might actually see some reciprocity. So the little whale here is J56. This is from 2019 when J56 was, was just a little baby. And she is being babysat by J53 and J47. They're sitting with her at the surface. When we started filming this, what we didn't know is that just below them, J56's mom, J31, was down chasing fish. So she comes up with a fish in her mouth to her kid who's being babysat. And she breaks the fish up into some pieces and actually shares both with her with her kid who's just by her head there, but also with the babysitters. Um, whether or not this is this is kind of called indirect reciprocity. So in, in animal societies, you can see direct reciprocity where I feed you, you feed me, I help you, you help me in the same way. This is a different case where you're actually having potentially one kind of help being given. I'm going to babysit your kids. And in exchange, I'll give you fish. Um, we don't Obviously, we need to do a lot more observations to be sure that that's what's happening, but it's an interesting potential. And then this uh, this last one is is really bizarre to me. So that's J that's L88 there. That is an adult male. The whales behind him are the L54s, whales he travels with, not related to him. Uh, as he came up, he broke a fish in half that L54 is now grabbing, and she's going to then share with her two sons. In the northern residents, adult males almost never, like, they do not tend to share nearly as much as adult females. Only about a fourth of the prey items that adult males get, get shared. This is the only time I've, we've, I've filmed a fully adult male come up with a fish while they're surrounded by other animals, and he immediately shared it with animals who are not related to him. Uh, I... You know, it's a, it's again, it's an anecdotal thing because we're still in the process of collecting and analyzing the data, but it's not the kind of thing I expected to see when we started this project was fully adult males sharing with non-relatives. Not only do you not tend to see adult males sharing in the Northern residents, they definitely don't share with non-relatives. They tend to share with their moms or grandmas. So this, there's something going on with the Southern residents and how they direct food sharing that seems to be really different than what the other resident populations we've studied do. And it seems to me to reflect their social structure where strong social ties extend beyond the matril line and into the pod in general, into a larger group of animals. And in human societies, you know, food sharing is one of the main ways we maintain social contacts and help each other out. In killer whale society, it seems to be the same. I don't, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that in this society where there's these really intense bonds outside of the matriline, those are also reinforced with prey sharing, just like the within matriline bonds. I, I think it's, it's really fascinating. Yeah. That, um, that's gorgeous video. Oh, so, thank you. That's relaxing too. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been doing this for for how long? Um, so I've worked with Southern residents since 2013. Um, I started at the at the Whale Museum and with Soundwatch, and then uh, in 2015 I co-founded the Orca Behavior Institute, which is still running. And uh, I've been working with the Center for Whale Research since 2017. We started drone observations in 2018. Um, we've you know we've published. Um, we published one paper off that drone project, just looking at social relationships based on physical contact. We're still collecting data to really analyze and write up, um, you know, what we see in prey sharing, which is why when I'm talking about all this, you know, it's observation and anecdote rather than, you know, statistics about how often they share in particular ways, because we're still, we're still doing this project. So yeah, so I've been, I'm, I'm coming up on a decade of working with Southern residents, which um, yeah, which is, is a, is a good, Good chunk, good chunk of my life at this point. That's so cool. And and what 
I'm always curious. So we've had we've had um, we've had some superstars on. So thank you for being part of our superstar guest list. Oh. Um, and and I'm always curious to know um, how or why. How did you start this? Like, what's your what's your what was your calling? Yeah, I don't know. So I've wanted to do killer whale stuff um, as long as I can remember. I do not remember a time in my life where I didn't want to work with wild killer whales. Um, yeah, I, you know, Free Willy probably had something to do with it when I was young. Um, I grew up in Florida. Um, I grew up, you know, before I knew anything about killer whales, I grew up going to SeaWorld, um, which, you know, not, not really seeing real killer whales, you know, seeing them in, in, in the wrong spot. But um, that did, you know, promote the kind of desire to, to know more about them. Um, especially because at that point, you know, the, the amount you learn at them, you learn about them going to SeaWorld is so surface level and kind of, you know, you don't, you didn't get much in terms of, well, what, what are they like in the wild? What are they like? Um, and, uh, yeah. So, and, and I was really lucky to make some contacts with, with, um, Cindy Hansen, who at the time was at the Whale Museum and now works with Orca Network. Um, and she kind of said, you should come out and do an internship and see how you like killer whales and see how you like Southern residents. And I did that. And uh, that was it. Like the first time I was on a, a research boat with, kill with resident killer whales that I don't think at that point I could have ever done anything else. That was it. Um, yeah. Gosh, that's just, I don't know. Alejandro, before we all jumped on, I was, I was convincing Michael to give me a corner of the of a boat one of these days so I can get out there. I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And, and I'm landlocked. I'm here in New Mexico. So we were having that conversation as well before. And I just, you know, it's, it's that, that pool. So I think that's awesome that you got on there and you knew this is, this is, this is it. This is what you should be doing. And thank you so much for, for, for doing what you do. Um, and documenting, as you know, we're all, we're all here for, for Scally Chuck to not in, and so knowing more about her family, knowing more about the plight of, of all the Southern residents is really yeah. important for, for everyone who's watching um, yeah. today. So, so well, thank you for that. We got, her, we got her family right behind me up on the wall there. So um, How, uh, have, have you been out there with, with her family? I mean, what, what can you so, tell us? Yeah, I've, 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 I've spent my time out on the water with, with Pod and the L12s who we think she's, you know, based on the photos of the capture probably probably an L12. Um, uh, yeah, there, I haven't been out with them recently. Um, I'm actually here at the center currently doing a, a big killer whale field season. Um, so we're looking at these same kinds of questions about prey sharing um, in, the, in the mammal eating killer whales. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've spent my time out with the L12s, but honestly with how their travel patterns have been in recent years, um, the salmon aren't showing up as much as they should and at the right times. I haven't spent a lot of time with the L12s in the last couple of years. Um, you know, as far as we know, L25 is still is still around. She's by far the oldest whale in our population at this point. Um, you know, they've they've had they've had a, a, a big loss recently with L41 uh, uh, being gone in a couple of years ago. Um, so you know, overall, I think the family's doing all right. They've they've had their losses, and as sad as it is to think about, you know, L twenty five, she's she's an old whale. You know, we're not. I don't. You know, we're not going to have her around forever, and I don't know what they'll do when they don't have her around. Um, but I'm glad glad she's still around now, as far as we know. Yeah, we did a we did a tribute to her uh, on Mother's yeah. Day. <laughs> For our Mother's Day um, show, and and you hear Alejandro every week talking about talking about um, Ocean Sun as well. We we really hope to have Toki come back and, and be able to hear her mom again. Have them have them nice. to each other. It was that's a big um, big goal for us for sure. Um, Howard, oops, you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Oh, you uh, yeah. okay. Now I'm loud. <laughs> uh, Great. Well, that was really fascinating. Thank you a lot for showing those uh, those clips and giving us that insight. I mean, that's sort of an inside look into how they relate with each other and and what their sort of normal sharing and and 
behaving is like. And I think it's just really fascinating and interesting on its own merits, but also because, you know, Toki is from them. She mm. was raised, you know, from them uh, till she was about four years old. We don't know for sure, but that's pretty much the consensus from the length and the eyewitnesses at the time. Uh, so at four years old, uh, in your uh, experience with Southern residents, how how adult are they? How competent, mm. how capable, how big, how much do they communicate and share food or uh, participate in the in the sort of the cultural rituals or any of the socializing that goes on? It's a great question. So I guess there's a few different parts there. So in terms of prey sharing, at three and four years old, I would much more expect them to be a recipient of prey sharing than a, a sharer still. Um, I see, you know, I see whales younger than that um, chasing fish, maybe even helping to catch them, but a lot of unsuccessful chases. So they're still learning even at that age, but they're, they're involved, they're in there, they're well integrated. And actually what we found looking at the drone video and looking at the social contacts is that those young whales are the most well integrated in the pod. They are the social hubs of the pod are these young, young whales. Everybody is, is wanting to, is obsessed with the babies. Um, so yeah. four years old, she would have been, you know, kind of the center of, of that matriline's life unless they had a younger kid at the time. Um, she would have been, you know, one of the keystone individuals in their social lives. She would be the animal that everybody is kind of coming into contact with and checking in on. Um, uh, yeah, and, and she would have, by three, she would have um, I've been more or less fully weaned, you know, she would have been, they, they kind of slowly transfer onto solid food. It's not a, you know, a, a solid cutoff. By three years old, she would have probably been done nursing and be starting fully weaning. And that's when I would expect them, you know, that training they do to catch fish to really kind of kick into gear and they mm -hmm. maybe start catching their own fish. Maybe if they have younger siblings, even start sharing, I guess, you know, we don't know kind of what her full family tree looked like at the time because we don't, we don't know how many of, yeah, we, we just don't know. If she had younger siblings, she would have been starting to kind of help them catch fish, just like you saw J51 helping, you know, trying to get fish for J58. Um, and I mean, she would have definitely, uh, you know, been involved in the other non-foraging kind of traditions. You know, she would have been in there when they're traveling, if they're doing their resting lines, she'd be right in the resting line reading ceremonies, all of that stuff she'd be involved in. I think, like I said, so in terms of social interaction, the younger individuals are are the center of attention. So she she would, yeah, she would have been part of part of a family. Interesting. Mm. Uh, well, I really applaud your work out there and look forward to more of it. Uh, and uh, it tells us so much. And it's so it's it's not invasive, you know, they don't know that there's a grown what is the elevation that you usually fly above the whales? We we fly no lower than 100 feet and usually quite a bit above that. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, our protocol is we, we have it written that if we ever see a reaction to the drone of any kind, anything that's a clear reaction, a change in behavior, serps act behavior, we, we stop observing them for the day. Right. We haven't seen it happen yet, so we've, it's never had to happen. It's something we're looking for. But as as far as we can tell, they don't seem to know we're looking at them. Um, yeah. yeah, well, that bird's eye view really gives us a look into just their normal daily behavior. You know, I mean, it really yeah. gives you a sense of how they live unperturbed, just out there, you know, foraging, socializing, playing, traveling, whatever they're doing. And I just think that's fascinating. It gives us such insights into how they live. It, it's something I always say when, when people ask, like, you know, what is what is kind of the ideal whale encounter for you? You know, leaving aside the data we want to get and everything. And for me, yeah, I, you know, I know a lot of people really love, you know, having the whales look at you and, you know, making that connection. And I, I get that. For me, the ideal whale encounter is I'm sitting there and I'm watching them be whales and I'm yeah. not involved at all. I'm just yeah. there and I get to see it, but I'm not a factor in their decision making and their behavior. That to me is the ideal whale encounter. Yep, um, the bird's eye view basically and just, you know, how they live. And in clear water, you can see pretty deep, I would assume, 20 or 30 feet sometimes. Yes. In very yeah. clear water. Yeah. 
Yeah, if it's clear and there's not glare and you know it's nice and calm, you can you can see right down in there. And um, even even when you can't see that deep, the residents really, unless they're unless they're foraging, they spend most of their time pretty close to the surface. I was actually surprised to see that the transients, the bigs, they you know between surfacing sequence will dive deep and you'll lose them. Mm -hmm. um, but the residents, you know, we see them come up and down and up and down. And I always kind of pictured them coming up, going deep and coming back up. They're really just staying pretty close to the surface most of the time. You can track them consistently. It's, uh, huh. it's really cool. And yet Chinook tend to travel at, uh, what, two or 300 feet in depth yeah. usually? Isn't that yeah. right? So what I, what Maybe they I bring to, them up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a couple videos um, uh, that kind of, give me some clues as to what they're doing. So I have a video of J31, which is a bit heartbreaking from 2018. For half an hour, she was at the surface, head pointed down, just scanning back and forth. And we think she was, we didn't have a hydrophone in, but we think she was just echolocating. She was down at Eagle Point, which is one of their you know, best foraging areas. Actually, that's where that first video was filmed. And for 30 minutes, just scanning, looking, uh, presumably looking for something to chase. Um, so I think what they do is a lot of staying at the surface, not at Chinook depth, scanning down to Chinook depth. When they find something, they dive. And yeah, I have another video of, of J47 at that same place, you know, up from the gloom, you see this, this just explosion of fish uh, running away and J47 in the middle of them. So I think they often will go down and chase them up. We know from some of the D-tag work that they do make kills, you know, they do catch fish at, at depth as well and then bring them up. But that's kind of the game they play when they're foraging is the, the fish don't have to come up. So the best thing for the fish is to go as deep as they can and run away and hope the whale has to come up for air uh, before they catch them and give them a chance to you know lose them, lose them in some rocks or something. Do you see uh, cooperative foraging, uh, like herding fish into each other's uh, realms? It's <laughs> a good question. So I've certainly seen group foraging, you know, two or three whales chasing a single fish. Um, how cooperative it is, I think we'll have to do some, some serious movement analysis and some, you know, some real, real big modeling efforts to see, you know, are they catching fish quicker when there's multiple whales chasing it? Or is it basically everyone chasing it independently and whoever gets it shares? I haven't seen, you know, there are reports from the, the early days of studies of, you know, a, you know, half a dozen whales chasing fish into cliffs and stuff like that, you know, herding them against rocks. I've never seen anything like that. That might be the kind of thing that works better when there's more fish to go for, right? You actually have a school of fish that you can chase, whereas I think mostly these days they find ones and twos, um, you know, maybe trios of fish. Um, so definitely group foraging, cooperative foraging, unclear. Um, the bigs, huge cooperative foragers. Um, just the other day, um, we were out on, on a, a group of, of T's, the T-75Bs, and they found a seal. Um, and the way seals try to avoid whales if they're in the open water is they dive. And they, we think, like hide under a rock, basically, and stay very still and hope the whales give up. But these whales were taking turns. So you'd see two whales at the surface, and you wouldn't see the other two. And then those two would come up and the other two would die. So they were taking turns keeping the seal pinned. And eventually the seal had to make a break for shore and that's when they caught it. So they absolutely coordinate and cooperate. So killer whales are definitely, as we all know, very capable of it and they will do it. I think the only question with the residents is how much is it worth it to really coordinate when you're catching a salmon versus just saying, okay, whoever catches it, share, but we'll just each kind of chase whatever is near us. Have you seen um, adult males go after a salmon? I, I recall seeing several times when adult males would get into these like whirlwinds of yeah. uh, thrashing activity, a tail up, uh, you know, I mean, uh, all kinds of of uh, yeah. activity, like they are just on the tail of a salmon and then <laughs> they won't let go. But, you know, how can they maneuver as agilely, as quickly and turn as fast as a salmon? They seem to be able to do it. Have you seen some of that? Um, I haven't. We haven't yet gotten a really good long chase with an adult male chasing a fish yet. It's one of the things we're really looking to to expand our catalog on in the next few years because it's one of the things we're really interested in. Exactly the question you had: How do these large adult males 
maneuver to catch a salmon. And in addition to that, we know that sa Chinook salmon, largely because of fishery induced evolution, are getting smaller. So the salmon are getting more maneuverable because smaller fish tend to be more maneuverable. The big males are less maneuverable. How well can they catch fish? We know from the DTAG work that the adult males do dive and catch their own fish, but how efficient are they? How long does it take them? Um, are, how, what's their intake? Is that maybe one of the reasons why adult males, it seems are more reliant on their moms than the females are? So when a mom, when a mother orca dies, both of her, both male and female kids uh, will have uh, increased mortality over the next few years. They'll, they'll be more likely to die in the next few years, but the effect is way bigger in males. Um, and one of the thoughts is exactly what you're saying is, well, maybe it's harder for them to catch individual fish because they're so much bigger. They have these, you know, big pectoral flippers that I'm sure are great for attracting the ladies, but don't look particularly good for maneuvering. Right. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's something we're interested in doing. I've certainly seen what you're talking about from the boat. And I, I do wonder if it seems like adult males can do it more, but I wonder if part of it is when an adult female is doing that, she's pretty much just underwater. When an adult male is doing that, you see the fin sticking up. You see the dorsal fin cutting through the surface and kind of rooster tailing around. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really hoping that this summer we get a bit more footage. We have some we have some footage of adult male chases, but it's not in the clearest water and you can't always see where the fish is. So it's it's not as, as good as you know some of the other stuff we have. So I'm hoping to expand that catalog a bit. Hmm. Another thing I recall uh, is that adult males would often be out on the perimeter. Yes. You know, the, the, the close matriline, the, you know, the grandmas, moms and the sisters would be closer to the inside and kind of in, in bigger groups. And it might be a half mile or a mile away would be a, a adult male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think they are uh, like scouting? Are they, are they scanning for where fish may yeah. be and maybe report back? And, uh, you know, that's sort of an imagining. I don't know how you would know that. No, but. yeah. It's a great question. And you're absolutely right. That is to completely a pattern we see even in small groups like even with the l54s and l88 you'll see l88 kind of on the perimeter you know it's just three whales in shore and him on the perimeter um in the northern residents uh that's been it's been suggested that it's not necessarily they're further from shore it's not the distance from shore they're going for it might be the depth and so there's some thought that because adult males are bigger, they have deeper lungs, they can forage in deeper water, they can dive deeper and, and, and go for deeper fish. Whether that is a thing of, well, you can't forage there, so I will, and if I catch something, I'll share it, or whether it's, you need a lot of food because you're huge. So you go forage where we're not looking, get yourself some food and we'll get the babies and, and the kids some food over here where they can forage. Which one of those it is, it's really hard to say. Um, but it's, yeah, even, even when they're not foraging though, even in, you know, resting lines, um, where they're just, you know, perfectly parallel up and down, I, you often do see the adult males on the offshore side. You know, you'll see the big fins kind of flanking the two sides. And I, I have no idea what's going on with that. I have no idea why they're kind of peripheral in that way. Um, we, Talking about you know the, the social contact stuff, the adult males are adult males are the most peripheral socially, right? They're the least likely to be coming in physical contact with other whales. So it, it might be a socially peripheral thing, or maybe it's a particular role they need to play. It's there, there's just so much we don't we don't know, and we'll probably never know, but we'll keep we'll keep yeah. trying. Right. Another hypothesis might be that. As bigger animals, they would have a bigger echolocation mm. capability, just a, yeah. a wider range, yeah, and might be able to, uh, you know, scan further and yeah. sort of, you know, be a scout for the rest of them. Could be, could be. That's not a bad point. Yeah, they have bigger lungs, bigger melons, bigger receivers in their jaw. So they, I don't know, I don't know if they've ever, I don't know of a study that's tested the echolocation range of males and females, but it would intuitively makes sense to me, yeah, that males would have a better range than, than females. It's an interesting hypothesis. I'll, I'll, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I made up a theory. Um, also, I recall, and I've seen so many photos of uh, pairs of adult males, or three mm. sometimes, often including a, a juvenile. 
uh, male. Um, it may be a nephew, a younger brother, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but it seems like that happens a lot. So it's like there's a boys club yeah. <laughs> going on uh, along with, you know, as well yeah, on the perimeter, you know, we didn't certainly within echolocation and vocalization range, but uh, you know, sort of out beyond the others. I think that as you know, the socializing of the young males, I think a lot goes on yeah. there. Uh, they're sort of, you can call it babysitting, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's more, uh, I think, just uh, keeping company and sort of, you know, raising, you know, bringing yeah. into the family. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something to that. So we find, you know, both males and females, we find what uh, what we social networking people would call assortment by sex, which is just a fancy way of saying males tend to interact with other males and females tend to interact with other females more so than you'd expect. Um, and yeah, we, we call it exactly like you said, we'll often on the water be like, ah, there's the boys club. And it'll be in the case of J pod, you know, J 45, J 44, J 39 and J J 49, you know, the young males and maybe one or two adults or, or close to adult males with them. Um, and, and yeah, it's, uh, in those groups, I often see a bit more kind of rough housing in terms of like the, the socializing is quite a bit more rough. That's where you see, you know, some whacking each other with the flukes, maybe even some little bites at each other. Um, and we do know that males at that age, um, we've analyzed, you know, thousands of photographs now and, and put out that we, we found that males of that age do have more scratches on them than they get more scratches per year than other age classes. So something happens around, you know, as they approach the age of puberty in males, it almost seems like the only other animals who want to socialize with them because they're being so rambunctious are other males of about the same age yeah, uh, and maybe older males. And I think there might be something to that, that, like adult males have a very particular role to play and you need to learn what that role is. And the only way to learn it is if you have a role model. I mean, that's, it's, we know in all kinds of, we know they learn from each other how to forage and the vocal communication and all this, all these things. There's no reason why they wouldn't also learn kind of their social role um, from from those adult males. And actually something I, I want to look at eventually, we need a lot more data is, yeah, if you can identify pairs of kind of role models, old males and young males who, who kind of latch onto them, when that young male becomes an adult, do they have a similar kind of social position in the network as that older role model? And, and we don't know, it's, it's something that's kind of been looked at in other species, but it's, it's the kind of thing I'd be really interested to look at once, you know, once the drone project's been going on for, you know, 10 years or something, you know, look at all that data and, and see if we can see anything like that. You have so well, much, oh, go ahead, yeah. Howard. Well, I was just gonna mention that uh, one of what seems to be a hallmark of, of uh, killer whale socializing is that uh, they don't seem to uh, joust for position, for dominance, for mm. you know, alpha male or female roles. You just don't see that or any evidence of it, any uh, you know, real harm done to each other. You know, those scratches may be just roughhousing and playing yeah. and you know, uh, getting attention or whatever, but, uh, but you don't see any any real, you know, uh, hostility go on between them? You? No. No, I mean, like I said, um, you know, we have, what, 30 hours now of resident killer whale footage. I think I've seen a fluke strike twice. I've seen them hit each other with their flukes twice in those 30 hours of footage. And both times, in one case, it was a pretty, pretty big bonk. It almost looked accidental. Um, it happened on the periphery of this match, of the J-17 match lines they were traveling and the entire rest of the natural line turned towards them and broke it up. Wow. Um, huh. Um, and uh, the other time it was in one of those groups of all males. And I think J, uh, I think it was J45 being kind of harangued by J47. And I think the rough housing just got a bit too much, gave him one good whack and swam away. Um, and I think that's the real key, right? Is if you're this hyper mobile, free ranging animal that's in these states that are miles and miles across, if a conflict happens, you just leave, right? You, you just swim away. Um, and so, yeah, I've never seen a, I've never seen, you know, a fight, a, a fight. I've never seen a bit of aggression escalate. I've seen rough housing. I've seen, you know, them opening their jaws at each other and I've seen single fluke strikes, but I've never seen anything that looked like it had the potential to really injure anyone yeah. involved. 
Great. Well, thank you. That's fascinating. Yeah. Stuff. Your, your and years tap- of research yeah. is, I mean, we, I, I hope you consider, uh, we've had, we have, I'm telling you, we've had superstars on here. So um, I hope you consider coming back because you have um, so much information and so much research. I mean, just in that, we could just talk about that, the, the male relationships we can talk mm-hmm. about, you, you know, and these can all be hour long um, shows. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, I mean, I, I, hope you, I do hope you consider coming back and talking. Yeah, about no, this is great. The, uh, the 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 footage was beautiful and the information is just um is great so thank you um for sharing that and you you said a few things um i just want to point out like what you just now said about um you know it's a, it's a great big ocean you can just get away um so really showing the difference between you know those who are who can't do that in and, and the mm-hmm. aggression and, and you touched on it at the very beginning you know seeing um seeing the whales in, uh, in captivity, um, I'm glad it sparked your interest. I really am glad it sparked your interest. Yeah. And um, you, you, you hit it on the, the nail on the head when you said um, it's not, you're not gaining the knowledge or the education by seeing them in that way, you know? Yeah. So, so what you're sharing with us, people don't get to see and, and, mm. and we want to do more of that so that people can know and see and, um, you know, without having to, to, to go to the parks to to see them. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. You also mentioned the salmon are getting smaller, um, and and we've been on. Uh, Dr. Giles w- was on with us last mm-hmm. week um, talking about that. There's um, a totem pole journey um, happening. Um, it's just finishing, actually, just finished. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, going around about that about the Snake River dams and mm-hmm. and all of that. So it's all connected. It all it all matters, you know. Um, yeah. So thank you for, for being with us. Um, Alejandro, did you have any questions for Michael? No, uh, what brought my attention was the way they, they catch and they share the food, even with no relatives. I think mm. they, are, they, are better than, they are doing better than human beings in the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, it's something, yeah, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily shocking because we kind of knew that they shared, but just the degree to which, as you're saying, they share with, with non-relatives, I think is, uh, this, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, a bit of a, you know, objective scientist type person. I try not to anthropomorphize, but, you know, there might be something we could learn there. Uh, even I would have to say, yeah, there might be something we could learn from that a uh, little bit. I think there's a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I do. I think there's so much we can learn from them. I, I say this all the time. I tell my spouse this all the time. I just, uh, I, I do believe they are uh, more intelligent and more connected than, than we are. We're just not smart enough to understand them mm-hmm. yet. And um, so thank you for sharing your knowledge again. Um, this was great. I, I will always take up an offer to talk about killer whales for an hour. So anytime. <laughs> well, we, we, will, we all gather every week to hear about them for an hour. So thank you. And, and yes, anytime you want to just reach out to uh, you have my email now. And um, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to some announcements. I do want to keep this at an hour. We're getting a little mm-hmm. bit close, but I do want to mention uh, if you've been seeing I'm flashing up here, um, www.whaleresearch.com. Please check out the website. Also on YouTube, um, Centers for Whale Research, fabulous video, um, fabulous video on on the YouTube channel. So um, folks at home, please feel free to check that out. We didn't get time to answer questions from the audience today, but Michael, um, if if you wouldn't mind, maybe sometime during the week, checking out the feed and and seeing if there's any specific questions for you that you might uh, be able to answer. I'd appreciate that. Uh, here we go with the announcements. It's very fast talking at the end. Um, the um, Gathering of the Eagles can, uh, canoe uh, journey is uh, starting today, started today, left Anacortes, um, going from Washington Park to Lopez Island, then San Juan Island, the 23rd and 24th, Orcas Island, 25th and 26th, and then the canoes will be landing in Lummi. Um, at four o'clock, that's the official landing at Lummi at the Stomish grounds there. Um, there's going to be a coastal jam at uh, 6 p.m. And Freddie was on this last week, inviting everyone, letting everyone know that they are welcome to to attend. Um, here's the cool uh, thing here that tells you about what I just said. 
Also, um, on that evening, they added, um, I took this picture, Totem Bridge film, um, from, from another site today. And the whale protector, uh, whale people, protectors of the sea. Um, it's an outdoor exhibition and film by the Lummi Nation. Um, and it was at the Natural History Museum. That is going to be there at the Stomish Grounds. So nine o'clock, all are invited. It's open to the public and free. I have not seen it. I've been wanting to see it. It's an outdoor thing. I think it's going to be really fabulous. I hope people um, are able to come out. And then on Saturday um, at noon, uh, Freddie said, get there a little bit early. Uh, we're doing the honoring for Jewel James, Master Carver Jewel James. Um, so please, if you are in the area, come out. I'm going to be there. I'm super excited. On that note, uh, keep your eyes posted on the Orca Network Lolita Tokitai page because I haven't talked to the guys here. We need to talk after the show uh, to see how we're doing uh, Sunday because I will be traveling back from um, Bellingham uh, during our regular schedule. So we might have to do a, a, our, our live just a couple hours later if that's okay, but we'll post it on here on, on how we're going to proceed with that. Everybody, thank you so much for, for joining us. Samuel, um, I would like to end with you, if that's okay, to close this out with prayer and, and your flute. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to say thank you to all who are participating. I want to say thank you very much to those of you, to all of you, who are doing this from the bottom of your heart. Being an elder and an older person, we sometimes wonder, we sometimes wonder what's going to happen in the future regarding our youth. I'm very encouraged to see the young people who are walking who are walking a, in a walk of life and preserving life. And from deep in their hearts, the young people know this is their place and this is where they have to be. It is their future. And it is our young people's dream that things get better on this land. So I'm always forever thankful to our young people, to our young warriors at heart. I wanna say thank you to everyone. I wanna say thank you to all the organizers. It takes time and energy. And most of all, I'm happy that there are those of you who look forward to this program every week and who look forward to see what is happening with the Orca families. So I'm very thankful for your energy. I'm thankful for your uh, hope. And I'm thank you for your blessings and prayers. O Creator, I pray in thankfulness, I pray in joy, I pray in joy for all our hearts that we feel. We feel happiness, we feel strength, and we know things will get better. And because of you, Creator, it is all possible. And thank you so much, Creator, for being with us. Mado, Shunabish. <laughs>